It was crazy, but at, at, at the same time, it was good because I looked at it and I was laughing. Wow, I've never seen Rhino as in charging, but I saw in your video. He no? was he was not happy with us being that close. And I thought, is he going to, he's coming he after us. He was just charging us. Welcome back to the mini series about Kenya and Masai Mara. If you haven't heard the first one, you should go back and listen to that one first. In this one, we're going on a game drive in Masai Mara and get attacked by an angry rhino. You are listening to The Radio Vagabond, your guide to taking that first step towards living a more fulfilling and adventurous life. If Palabo can do it, why can't you? But we start with Shane and Monica that you met in the latest episode. And one of the things we'll talk about is what to see in Nairobi. I'll also take you to the tallest building, and to the Giraffe Center. My name is Palabo. This is the Radio Vagabond, episode 228. Welcome back to Kenya. This is the Radio Vagabond. This episode is brought to you in part by Hotels25.com. It's a website that helps you find the best prices on hotels and guest houses and hostels around the world in one simple search. Hotels25.com. The Radio Vagabond. Gotta keep moving. Let's go back to Shane and Monica when I met them in Nairobi. They were both talking about the amazing stuff there is to see around the country. But there's also a lot in the capital itself. Well, there's two things here. So, of course, uh, Karen Blixen Museum, of course, famous. And when you go there, they actually have some of these clothing, Robert Redford, Mineral Street War, and other things from the set and original items from Karen Blixen. I would also recommend the Giraffe Centre, where uh, that's in Karen as well, and also the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust, which takes in orphaned elephants and rhinos, but they're best known for elephants. And they have a one-hour viewing every day, and it is remarkable. And you've learned the story of these elephants. So you hear people that elephants and poachers are taking all these elephants. When you're there, you realise probably half the orphaned elephants are not taken by that. They fall into a hole and they can't get out. And so it's impossible. So they go on or it gets lost from the rest of the herd for some unknown reason. You know, a lion might scatter them and it gets lost and wanders into a village. Or uh, the mother dies from being attacked by a snake or something similar. And, and then... It, It's an orphan, and they take these in, and that is a fantastic experience. So for Nairobi, I would say, Karen Blixen home, have a look, because it is historical in quite a few ways, and if you love the movie, then you'll love seeing what's on offer there. I'd say the Giraffe Centre, which... Yeah, uh, yeah, the Rothschild Giraffe, that is fantastic, and the work they do is truly amazing, and especially in encouraging children the importance of conservation and and the wildlife within Kenya. Tremendous work, and then the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust. And it's interesting, you know, there's a lot of environmental, these sort of programs in Kenya. But these two, the Giraffe Centre, it has a longer name. It has a really long name, I can't remember. And the Sheldrick, no one ever says a bad word about them. You know, they are just very, very well respected. So I would recommend them. And don't forget Nairobi National Park if you don't have a lot of time here. Uh, we went to Nairobi National Park and we saw we saw giraffes. We saw a herd of buffalo, drove through a herd of buffalo. There's the usual impalas and stuff like that uh, floating around the various deers. There's baboons. If I had more time, there's even lions in there. Nairobi is the only city that has a very big park in the middle of the city, very green. And then we have uh, uh, Bomas of Kenya. Bomas of Kenya is where you have to experience all the 42 tribes in Kenya, how the dancers, you need to go there as well. Bomas of Kenya is on your way to Karen. And then we have Giraffe Center. We have Davis and Sheldrick. Yeah, Uh, I'm going there. We have Karen Blixen. We have Karen Blixen. But we have the real Karen Blixen in Nairobi. <laughs> yeah, but she's Danish. So. <laughs> it's good you came to visit your ancestors <laughs> in Nairobi. And then we have National Museum as well. So uh, Nairobi, you cannot finish a day. And yeah. then the Nairobi city life as well. Yeah. So Nairobi has a lot to offer. For clients who are coming for short visit, transit, they can experience Nairobi life, mm. both in the, in the wild national park, and every every part of thing that is within Kenya, you can get in Nairobi as well. Yeah. But the real test, you can go outside, out of Nairobi. Both Shane and Monica mentioned the Giraffe Center. It's a creation of a Kenyan non-profit organization 
the African Fund for Endangered Wildlife. Their main purpose is to educate Kenyan school kids on their country's wildlife and environment, as well as give visitors an opportunity to come into close contact with the world's tallest animal. I went there a few days earlier and spoke to educator Daniel Ntour. Hi, Daniel. Before working at the Giraffe Center, he studied tourism and wildlife management. I've been spending uh, about an hour walking around. I felt the giraffe's tongue in my hand as I was feeding them. And uh, I've always had a really a deep love for giraffe. They're such a magnificent animal. Thank you very much. Uh, giraffes, they have a lot of fat. One of them is when you're feeding them, you will feel the roughness of the tongue. Yeah, roughness, almost like yeah, a big cat's yeah. tongue, just like a, something rough. Eh? Yeah. But giraffes are very gentle. The saliva is antiseptic. Let's find why the saliva is antiseptic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, okay, let's go. As you enter the giraffe center, you'll be handed some food pellets in a coconut shell. Then you get even closer as you walk up to the feeding platform. So first thing first... Yeah, as, as I was entering, uh, I got this uh, half a coconut shell with uh, some food in it. Uh, what kind of food is that? Yeah, we call them uh, giraffe pellets. They are made of dried grass, molasses and corn. Uh, it's just a good meal for the giraffes, but it's a snack. Yeah, it is yeah a snack. that's why giraffes are on diet. Uh-huh. Yeah, because this is just a snack for them. So, and, and then, uh, obviously, this is a place that's so cool for kids, and uh, the, the kids are feeding them one little thing at a time, and the, the giraffe, they just take it. Um, we give a little bit because we say giraffes on diet, because mm-hmm. this is not their original feed. They have their own feed. Mm-hmm. They go for the trees and the leaves yeah. and the grass as well, and later they'll take water. Yeah, and, uh, and we're walking kind of on a boardwalk here uh, to where the giraffes are because obviously they're so tall, so we need to be higher up than them. And then they're just uh, standing there with their heads in and seeing where can I get a snack. Uh, we used to feed down there where you can see, but nowadays now we can see the giraffes eye on eye. Yeah. 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 And are the, are the giraffes there all the time or are they yeah. um, in, a, in a certain period of time? So they don't get fully feeded on snacks? That's a good question. Um, here at Giraffe Center, the giraffes, they feed naturally. But when we want you to interact with the giraffes, we have to give them snacks, what I'm going to give you right now. Mm-hmm. That's what makes them come closer yeah. to where we are standing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And now we're walking over to the, the giraffes. Yeah, the first point you will see is the instruction on how to feed the giraffes. And we have like 11 instructions, but the greatest is the feed the giraffes one pellet at a time. Oh, see, I didn't read that when I came in. I gave them a handful. <laughs> so they really like me a lot more yeah. than the other kids. Yeah, but the, the instruction is feed giraffes one pellet at a time. Kenya has three subspecies of giraffe, and in the late 70s, there were only 130 of the Rothschild giraffe left on the grasslands of East Africa. So the African Fund for Endangered Wildlife was founded in 1979 by the late Jack Leslie Melville, a Kenyan citizen of British descent, and his American-born wife, Betty Leslie Melville. They began the Giraffe Center after discovering the sad state of the Rothschild giraffe. Now there are over 300 Rothschild giraffes safe and breeding well in various Kenyan national parks. And they have 12 of them here in the Giraffe Center. And here at Giraffe Center, we do the breeding of the one of the three subspecies of giraffes. Kenya, we are blessed to have three subspecies of giraffes. The greatest that we have here is the Rothschild giraffe. When you go to Masai Mara, you will see the Masai giraffes. When you go to the northern Kenya, you will see the reticulated giraffe. Mm-hmm. The big difference about all the giraffes that we have is the body spots and the location where you will find these giraffes. And, and in there, there's uh, kind of an exhibition where there's a lot of uh, uh, plaques that show the uh, different facts. And I, I could see a list of the giraffes you have here, and many of them are actually born here. Yeah, we are heading there, and I will tell you every giraffe and their character. Every giraffe has a different personality, just like human beings. Really? Let's find out what this does. 
Daisy the giraffe. Daisy. Yeah, on, on this whiteboard uh, there are um, 12 giraffes. A lot of them with names, uh, then a few unnamed. Uh, but uh, And I can see that more than half is born here. This is our education platform where we give more information about the giraffes. Currently we have 12 giraffes and um, we have like six mature giraffes. Yeah. Those are the breeding males and females. We keep one male, which is Eddie, Betty, Kelly, Daisy, Stacy, Eddie, and Salma. Those are the breeding males and females. From Lily to the unnamed one, eight months now, they will get a chance to go back to the national park. But once they are two years. Life is short, and there is so much to explore. I won't let a second go to waste. Yeah, time goes fast. Step it up now Take some chances, cut some ropes Ooh, ain't gonna wait much longer There will be no sleep tonight I'll chase my dreams While I'm still young and single Nothing's gonna stop me, no I have to run, cause life is now How come the three youngest are unnamed we name our giraffe when they uh, come to one year. When they attain the one year age, we name them. Okay, why not before? <laughs> um, I think um, it's our norm to name them once they come to, to one year because they get now to understand their names. Ah, okay. And, and do they really? They do. Giraffes are very smart. Wow. They are very smart. So, very. so like Eddie, who's 10 years old, or now, Betty, Ray, who's uh, Eddie 21. Eddie recognizes his name. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He has a very nice memory. And one of the best giraffes that we have in the yeah. center. And you mentioned something about different personalities. So, so uh, what's Eddie's personality? A personality for Eddie is a gentle giant. It's a big giraffe, but very gentle. Salma, when you stand on the side, she will headbutt you. But most of the time, you feed her eye to eye. Mm. Yeah. Then Kelly, number two, Kelly. 20 years old, Kelly. 20 years old. Uh, for her as well, she had butts, but you feed her one uh, eye on eye, one pellet at a time. Yeah. Daisy, four, is 13 years, and Daisy, um, she doesn't like small kids at all. Oh, really? Yeah, that's another uh, hilarious personality that she doesn't like small babies at all. Betty, Stacy, Eddie. Those are the best giraffes that you'll meet at Giraffe Center. All the giraffes are good, but we have different personalities. The giraffes here in the Giraffe Center lives until they're around 28 years old. But those that live in the national parks only live until they're 10 or 15 years. Daniel explains why. In the national park, sometimes we have, they get a lot of stress, diseases, drought, all that now combined is a disaster. And sometimes habitat loss and poaching. They live longer here because it's more stress-free and they get snacks and they, uh, <laughs> they get a lot of love and attention. Yeah, because uh, when there is any outbreak, we are able to vaccinate them because the number is not, is not that big. Then um, a lot of treats and a bigger space for them to feed every day. Should we go out to the giraffes? Yeah, now we head to the giraffes when we have to have our mask on. Then we go on to the feeding platform and are face to face with the giraffes. Here we are with the giraffes. Now we meet Kelly. So that's Kelly. This is Kelly. Kelly is 20 years. And we have Betty, who is the oldest, 21 years. Yeah, yeah then uh, Betty will have seven more years, then they die of old age. Like we said, they have different personalities. Now for Kelly, you have to alert people not to be too close to Kelly because Kelly had bats. So we give her a distance while feeding. Do the, it's a, it's a, so that you can get hurt or should we be kind of um, afraid of getting a headbutt? Yeah, headbutt is not something so nice. So we have to be so very careful with the giraffes. And it's a personality. That's some headbutt. It's not... Uh, yeah, it's something that you must be careful with. Inside the giraffe center area, there's an exclusive five-star hotel the Giraffe Manor. It's one of Nairobi's most iconic buildings. One of the most fascinating things about the Giraffe Manor is its 
resident herd of giraffes who may visit morning and evening, poking their long necks into the windows in the hope of a snack before retreating to their forest sanctuary. Yeah, it's one of the few uh, very nice uh, hotels that you will meet uh, in Nairobi. So the greatest thing that you'll do there is uh, carry a lot of experience because you will dine with the giraffes. They come to your table. You'll have evening tea with the giraffes as well. (laughs) So if you're sitting outside uh, having a cup of tea or Kenyan coffee and a little bit of snack, you should be careful. There might be a giraffe that comes in and and, and eats with you. (laughs) The giraffe will just come to your table and then you will enjoy everything with the giraffes. (laughs) Good. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thanks to Daniel Mentour for educating me about the giraffes and the giraffe center. As both Monica and Shane mentioned, it's well worth a visit, and I can vouch to that. Have you ever wondered what the places in this podcast actually look like? I have. So, I started following the Radio Vagabond on Instagram, simply by searching Radio Vagabond. Before we go back to Masai Mara, where you can join me on a game drive and the rhino that charges our van, Monica mentions one more thing here in Nairobi. And then also remember to visit KICC. It's the tallest building where you'll be able to see Mount Kenya and Mount Kilimanjaro while you are on the rooftop. So make sure you go to the town to see. Amazing view. The KICC Tower is the part of the Kenyatta International Convention Center. It's an icon and a landmark for Kenya. KICC boasts of being a leading facility in the meeting industry in East Africa. And right after my meeting with Monica, I went up there. I made it to the top of the KICC building, uh, which is a big tower uh, where you can really get a good good view of uh, Nairobi. It's stunning from here. It's so funny, when I, I got up the elevator and I walked outside, I could, yeah... It was a nice view. And then I was all alone and I thought, hmm, this is weird. Am I really the only one? Uh, after making my way around the building and I thought that was it, there was a security guard who came over and said, oh, you need to go up the stairs to go to the rooftop. And now I'm up here. Uh, and uh, it is really the rooftop. Only four other people are up here. So not that many people. But... My God, what a view. Monica told me that uh, the the view from here is uh, all the way to Mount Kenya, but but only on a clear day. And uh, it's not a clear day today, so you can see far. But uh, there it's a bit cloudy, and uh, and, and you, you, you can't see all the way to Mount Kenya, but you can see a lot. Stunning, stunning view. I spoke to two of the four people that I met on top of the tower. The dentist, Abraham. My my, my name is Abraham Ruto. Abraham Ruto. Yes, Abraham Ruto. 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 My favorite Nairobian dentist. (laughs) Yes, yes, that is very good. And the young pastor, Robert. And uh, my name is Robert. Robert Biwot. And Robert, you're not a dentist. I'm not a dentist. (laughs) I'm a pastor. (laughs) <laughs> oh really? Yeah. Oh wow. Yes. Yeah. You're much welcome to this. Thank you so much. Beautiful and my name is Pala. I'm ah, but, just uh, visiting here, but I feel almost Nairobian. Ah, yes. that's okay. very, very good. The best and worst about living here. Let's meet the locals. So are you both born and raised here? Yes, yes. We, we were raised in far away from here. That is another district called Nandi. Okay. But we came here for work. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and it is the capital. So what's the good thing about living in Nairobi? Yeah, the good thing being in Nairobi is that she in, there is some everything good. There is everything. You can access everything. The internet, uh, the information, yeah. your uh, electricity, water, yeah. and food. Yeah. Yes. And in, in so many ways, it's a super modern uh, city that would uh, compare to many European cities. <laughs> we can't see that. Either. No, but but it's a good one. But it's but it's it, it's it's, it's yeah. Central. 
I haven't been everywhere in Africa. I saw so many countries, but um, when I look at it, I see Kenya and South Africa as the two most modern countries. Yes, uh, would yes, you agree? Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What are some of the things that needs to be improved? Road work, the network for the roads. Yeah. You have a lot of traffic. <laughs> yes, yes, a lot of traffic too, maybe. Yeah. The road for about three hours. Ah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it can it can take either twenty minutes or three hours. Three hours. Yeah. yeah. Like three hours. Yeah. Very boring. Yeah. Yes. You're also building a, a big, big uh, yes. highway now. Yes. That should help a lot. Yes, yes, sure, sure, sure. That one should really help. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We do appreciate for President Uru Kenyatta. Is he a good president? Uh, he's a good, as compared to other presidents. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. We do appreciate. Yeah, yes. and you enjoy free elections. And, uh, yes, yeah. yes, we do enjoy free elections. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Robert, you don't say so much. I think he's in a better place to <laughs> respond to your <laughs> questions. He's a visitor. <laughs> <laughs> but you're a pastor. You, 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 you should be normal to talk. <laughs> a dentist only speaks when people can't answer back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. For now, he's in a better place to respond. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. But I can say something about spiritual, spiritual life. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You want me to say something yes, about spiritual, uh, spiritual life? Spiritual life. Uh, okay. We have a place after here. Let's mm-hmm. have it. Okay, okay. Let me say this. Huh? Nairobi is a beautiful place. The way you've viewed, you've seen. But let me uh, guarantee you that there is another beautiful place more than Nairobi that Jesus has already prepared for us. Mm-hmm. That's all I can say now. Yeah, <laughs> but um, so you, you obviously you're a, you're a Christian pastor. Is it yeah. Catholic, or Protestant? I'm a Seventh Day Adventist. Oh, pastor. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. But there, f- f- for now, many, for many now, I'm a student pastor. Yeah. I'm a student pastor in the yeah. in the University of. Uh, Eastern Africa, Barato. I was just about to say, you look very young for a pastor. Yeah. Like very, you're yeah. T- 19 years old. So. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes. But, but um, there also in Kenya, there are uh, quite a few uh, Muslims as well, right? Yeah, yes, yes. And, Even and here in Nairobi, we have so many uh, Muslims. Yeah. Yeah. But that is not a problem. There, you, all of you live in peace side by side and just respect each other's yeah, religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. As it should be. Yes. Yeah. Thank, <laughs> thank you so you. much, guys. Ah, Stay in thank touch. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. God bless. Good afternoon. Can I help you? Yes, my name is Bond. Radio yes, Yo Vagabond. If travel is your passion and you want escapism while still upholding your work and family responsibilities, you can travel vicariously from the comfort of your own home. This is the Radio Vagabond Podcast. Something else about safaris is your type of vehicle is very important. So, for example, let's say you're staying in a city. Let's pick a city uh, that I really like. I like Madrid a lot. Okay, say you're staying in Madrid and the accommodation you stay in is going to be nice and maybe not so nice, but the sights of Madrid do not change. Okay, doesn't matter if you're staying in a budget hostel or in a five-star palatial uh, hotel. The the museums and the art galleries will still have the same impact. It is different in a vehicle. If you are in a typical what they call these four-wheel drive vehicles, off-road vehicles, you see which are fully enclosed, your viewing experience is less. Uh, I would recommend going for a specially designed vehicle. Higher wheelbase, longer, no windows. And the animals aren't going to come up and jump into you. If they do, it'll be extremely rare. Um, because the drivers know. They know if there's a threat, they'll just drive off. Uh, so these are fantastic for viewing. You have a 360-degree view. Also be aware of your of if you're staying with a camp, when they will take you out. If they're limiting you to, say, four hours driving a day, I can, I can tell you, unless you're in a camp that has a water hole, 
you will want to be out on the game drive as much as you possibly can. So try to get something that gives you you know, four hours in the morning or four hours in the afternoon or maybe a morning and afternoon and then a whole afternoon and night. Try to get something that includes in their package get you out onto the game drive as much as possible. If you have a place with a water hole and you're happy to sit there, I mean, it's fantastic. There are a lot of those places around. But if there's no water hole there and there aren't animals coming, you'll be, you know, you know you'll be <laughs> pacing up and down for your next game drive. So I, yeah, choose carefully. Choose really carefully. Have a look at what they offer. What are their vehicles? Uh, look at their professionalism. Have a look at also how many hours you'll be out uh, in the field and uh, use that to determine what you choose. But my advice is very strongly is, I'm someone who always looks for a budget or bargain when they travel, as you know most people do. But when it comes to the Great Migration, don't do that. If you can afford it, go at least medium to top. Uh, and it will cost you, but you will never ever forget the experience. And then we're off to our first game drive in Masai Mara. It is one of the places with the highest photographic potential in Africa and the world. So the best way for you to get a sense of what we saw is to go to the radiovagbond.com and see some of the snapshot that I took of the wonderful wildlife and animals. We saw lions throughout the park and elephants, giraffes, a variety of gazelle species and zebra. Two cats that can be tricky to tell apart are cheetahs and leopards. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see the leopards that's one of the big five, but I saw many cheetahs. The leopards are here, but less common to see. And then another big five that is here, but is less common to see, the rhino. The Masai Mara shares its border to the south with the Serengeti in Tanzania. It's a huge area. 1,510 square kilometers, 583 square miles. So it's good to have an experienced driver like Dennis. And he's in constant radio contact with the other drivers, giving each other tips on where the animals are. Yes, uh, like in Masai Mara, all the drivers, uh, we have those radio calls, so they communicate where the animals are. It's like team spirit, teamwork. Yeah. It's always a teamwork. Yeah. So the dri- all the drivers, they are trained how to work as a team. As mentioned, it's rare to see the rhino. I've been on safaris before and I've never seen them. But all of a sudden, Dennis spotted one. Standing alone, grazing on the savanna, close to a waterhole, with no one around him. We were also the only van there. And to be honest, I think this was one of the rare occasions where Dennis didn't go straight on the radio and told the other drivers. Instead, we drove slowly in a circle around him. Not too close. I think we were around 30 to 40 meters away from him. And we all stood up and started taking pictures. I decided to shoot a video. And I'm glad I did, because what happened next was unbelievable and I'm glad I caught it on film, even though it was a bit shaky. The rhino saw us and wasn't happy with having his quiet time interrupted, so he came charging at us, full speed ahead, right towards us. Here's the sound I grabbed from the video. Can you hear him running and panting? Thank God Dennis saw it because he drove off just before the rhino was able to slam into the side of the bus. And according to Dennis, he would have. It would also have made a big hole in the side of the bus and potentially being life-threatening to the people sitting on that side of the bus. Dennis also told me that he'd never experienced anything like this in his many years of doing game drives here in the Mara. Did you see the video of us nearly getting attacked by a rhino? <laughs> yes, I Wasn't did. Wasn't that crazy? It was crazy, but at, at, at the same time, it was good because I looked at it and I was laughing. Wow, I've never seen a rhino as in charging, but I saw in your video. He no. was he was not happy with us being that close. And I thought, is he going to come? He's coming he after us. And, k-dukum, k-dukum, k-dukum. He was just charging us. And if, if, if Dennis hadn't just <laughs> driven off he would have rammed into the bus and probably made a big hole in the side of the uh, the van yeah uh, how many vans were there when it was just it was just us oh yeah 
<laughs> no, it was it was just us. Dennis, all all of a sudden, he saw it and then mm-hmm. drove slowly up in a circle around it and uh, get a good view. And then all of a sudden, wow. what are you doing here? And then, <laughs> and it was my first time seeing a, a rhino in, in in the wild, and I was like. Instantly, I, I got my on my phone and started filming because I didn't want to miss a second. Yeah. Finally, I saw one. That was a nice video. I saw it. That was a nice video. <laughs> and you are lucky to see Chad. Did you did you see the lions? Did you see the elephants? Did you see oh, yeah. all the big five? I the only ones we didn't see was the the leopard. Uh, oh, okay. We we did see cheetahs, and it can be tough for. Uh, a lay person like me to to tell the difference but it was cheetahs we didn't see the leopards yeah. but we saw the big four the big four <laughs> in the wild yeah yeah and then, and then we also we also saw uh, lions really up close um, just finishing breakfast and uh, he was full and it was beautiful big male lion and and was just posing for us to take pictures <laughs> Wow, that was great. So I saw, I follow you on Facebook, I follow you on on uh, IG, and I saw the photos. They yeah. were very nice photos. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> this episode is brought to you in part by Hotels25.com. It's a website that helps you find the best prices on hotels and guest houses and hostels around the world in one simple search. Hotels25.com. That's all we have time for in this episode, but there's more from Masai Mara coming up on the Radio Vagabond. In the next one, we're going hot air ballooning high above the savannah as the sun is rising. I like to say that flying above Masai Mara in Kenya is the ballooning paradise. You know? yeah. A quick disclaimer, this trip to Masai Mara was made possible by Monica Masungu from Scenery Adventures. But everything I've said in this episode is completely my own opinion. My name is Palabo, and I gotta keep moving. See ya. Radio Produced by RadioGuru.co.uk.